Thanks, I'm uh, here today joined by Peter Reid. I'm pretty excited about this, Peter. Um, I have spent a bit of time with you before um, and uh, I've never taken time to read much of your bio, but um, you, you started your academic career in 1978 uh, when I was still learning how to walk. And, um, and, and interesting, I knew you were, um, you'd studied physics, it was your background, and um, 120 publications and in, with the Australian Institute of Marine Science, Barry Reef, and, and, and eventually with the university. And, um, and the interests of oceanography, sediment coral reefs, instrument development, climate, mangrove swamps, geophysics and robotics. I'm not surprised to see the robotics and uh, instrument development because a, a lot of that comes through in a lot of things you talk about. So um, I'm really interested to have you here today. Uh, thanks for being here with us. My pleasure. Yeah, so uh, Peter, can you tell us a bit of a, um, just give us the skinny on why, you know, how you came onto the scene and, and how you found yourself to be, um, uh, became such a public figure and it talks, in, in the context of reef, I guess, and science in general. Yeah, so we've developed the instrumentation for measuring sediment concentrations around coral reefs and we've been working for decades on this. And we've come to the conclusion that, that mud from farms, for example, was just having no impact on the reef. And yet when you went to the big scientific organisations, they were saying exactly the opposite. Now we had more data than all these other groups put together, which was showing the opposite. So I started to raise the profile that a lot of what is said about the reef is just simply untrue. Mm. And then I started to look at other areas that were outside my direct field. So I was in sediment and currents and that type of stuff, but I then started to look at nutrients and other biological things. And you could see the same problems were occurring. Things were just wrong about what was being said about the reef. And it, I then realised that the, the fundamental problem here is there's a quality assurance problem about the way we do science, that we've got good people trying to do the right thing, but there's a quality assurance problem. And I started to get more and more vocal about that, and eventually um, people got very upset at the university, and then all hell broke loose, yeah. and I ended up getting fired for that. I'm really interested, like, at a personal level, because, um, you know, there was a, a, a criticism made of you when we were debating some reef science in part, or trying to debate reef science. Uh, it's only mm. one side offers some material... And the other just sort of says, uses the word science and thinks that makes a debate of it. Yeah. Um, but, you know, they'll say, um, you know, we said this is so, just one person that's um, saying this. And I think, well, isn't that the whole point of science is to have have that that um, that, that opposing view and um, and that sort of provides the platform for either side to say well no I, I that's a good point because this and this and this and we we construct a, a, a combined knowledge base from that well that's that tension. right you can't just discount somebody well there's just one person which by the way there isn't but i'll come to that mm. um you know all big scientific breakthroughs came from one person yep. bucking the trend now i'm not saying i'm in the the league of isaac newton or albert mm. einstein but but it does, uh, so that's not an argument to start with. But actually, I'm not the only person, right? I mm. know plenty of scientists who, who agree with me. Most of mm. them are actually getting older, have left the field, but a lot who are actually still in the field. Yep. But you just think about what it would be like. They saw what happened to me when I started to criticise what's going on, and they saw that I got fired, and that was the end of my career. Sure. So what, what is a young scientist who doesn't necessarily agree with what they're doing about the mackerel fishery at the moment or what's happening on farming, are they going to be able to stand up and agree with me that there is a quality assurance problem, even if they do agree? I agree, yeah. I, I meandered a little bit from my, what I was going to ask you um, previously. But it, it interests me in that the feelings that must have been going through at the time when, when the bubble burst, at where you finally... Uh, it must have been very liberating to to say, look, I'm going to call BS on this because, and and you've always been very careful in your language whenever I've spoken to you to say, this is my point of view and this is where I'm coming from, and um, and you've been very respectful of people on the other side of the debate saying um, that I'm not necessarily saying they're wrong. I'm just this. They need to disprove me because this is what I'm saying, and I've always admired that of you. But something must have hit a point for you to. Because you were, you must have been known some of the consequences of what you're going to say, to then end a thirty year career of of something you love. Because you only do something for thirty years if you love it yeah. and have a passion for it. And you, that must have been a pretty strong 
boiling up inside feeling that um, that let it all burst out to say, hang on, something's not right here. Yeah, I mean, I'd got to the stage where I just knew I had to say things, even though that there was clearly a, a risk. I didn't know. The, the actual words I said, I think it was on Alan Jones, and it, I was completely respectful. I, I don't... Um, I've always found that. Yeah. yeah. Um, but I said, look, there's a quality assurance problem. These guys are getting things wrong, and it's affecting farmers. It's affecting real people in a real way. Oh, dear. How dare you, Peter? Yeah, question. That, that, that's right. And people are saying, well... Uh, um, well, they they disagree with me, and most of the scientists, in fact, wouldn't have done what the university did to me. So a lot of my scientific opposition said, "Well, we disagree with with Rid on this, but you shouldn't have fired him." But I did get to a stage um, with the university when we were battling it out legally that there was an opportunity there to walk away and just be censured. So they they would censure me and say, you're not allowed to say that ever again. You're not allowed to to talk about this quality assurance thing ever again, but you'll keep your job. So that was an option for you? That was an option for me. And I remember there was a... I was talking with the people in the IPA, and they said, you know, for your own sake, you should probably take that. And Cheryl said, my wife said, you cannot take that. Wow. Um, Firstly, because it's not the right thing to do. Mm. And secondly, sooner or later, you will say it and then they'll have you, right? Mm. So we decided, no, we're going to dig in. And mm. um, and that's when the big legal battle um, went. And, of course, the legal battle, although it didn't end in a <laughs> the way we wanted, there was no payout. They agreed that ultimately, yes, the university was entitled to fire, fire me. But ironically, they said the university acted illegally in censuring me on the things that, that I'd said. But because of the work contract, they were technically le- it was technically okay for them to fire me for their illegal, for talking about their illegal activity. But that's a second legal matter. Yeah, have to be that's prosecuted. right. Yeah. And so, you- so the university was wrong to censure me. Wow. But because of the work contract, if I speak about their illegal activity, they can then fire me for that. So that doesn't seem like justice, but I guess that's the law. Mm. Uh, you know, that's just the mm. way it is. So we did prove a principle there about academic freedom, that academics at least technically have this right. Mm. But the reality is that it's it's sort of a technical right, but not necessarily a real right. That yeah. You try, you, I can say anything I like, but you actually try and do that and see where it gets you. That's yeah. the problem. I, and, but whether I agree with you or not on the reef, which I... Um, is immaterial or whether anyone agrees with you on the reef or not. It, it's just interesting that that's, they felt so strongly about that and leaving um, one of their accredited um, and uh, highly skilled um, assets there that they've invested so much in to turn their back and that they must have felt so strongly about having someone question question uh, the science there that, that it, that's the interesting part for me it, it is fascinating that they they thought it was so important that we've got this guy questioning the quality assurance systems which is and I'm broadening it I, so you're I'm not just, questioning you you could say that you're not quite saying they're wrong in that process you're just saying I think it should be quality had some quality yeah, assurance yeah that, that's right I mean I, I'm quite happy to accept that on many things there'll be good quality assured science where Mm. I'm uneasy about it. I think they may be wrong. But if it's gone through a process where I think that, all right, they have reviewed it properly, they've repeated the experiments, Mm. they have got a genuine, you know, a red team and a blue team battling it out rather than forming groupthink and people being scared to speak up. If it's gone through a a proper process, I'm happy to say, look, I disagree with this, Mm. but... But I accept that a due process has been has happened. Like the legal thing, I lost, all right? But there was a proper process, and I now accept, well, that was the law. Um, the, same we, the same is we in, in science. Um, but the fact is there isn't a proper process. Yeah. And it's not just in reef science, it's much broader. So I was looking at the context of, say, biomedical science, where they, they look at this so-called peer-reviewed science, and they find that when it is checked, about half turns out to be seriously flawed. Mm. And this is not just me. And this is why I'm saying it's not just me. Yep. We're talking about, there was a survey of uh, done by the most prestigious um, scientific journal in the world. It is a survey of science. And they, over 50% of scientists think there is what they call the replication crisis, where so much of the scientific literature, the stuff you see here on the radio every day, is actually flawed, and we've got to do something about it. 
And that's all I'm saying. You know, yep. We've just got to get quality assurance in yep. here. So we'll never necessarily be totally sure something's right, but we can have more confidence. More confidence. In, Th- yeah. This is such an important conversation yeah. for me as a, an aspiring politician that's in there and wants to do some good, probably like a lot of politicians. Yeah, but most. we were almost in there all. having a debate mm-hmm. about reef regulations. And make no question, these reef regulations, from an industry point of view, I've seen the production records of the Burdekin. This has the ability to wipe out the sugar industry. Mm. Not in the short term, no, but in the long the term, term. Yep. it does. That's has right. the ability because uh, a lot of those mills are, um, need a critical mass yep. going through them. And um, and and you, we've already seen the impacts of um, constraints put on fertiliser and what that impacts that's yep. had on mill production. So it's pretty easy to project that forward and see what happens. But long story short, it has the ability to wipe out the sugar industry in the long term. If not, maybe not completely, but there could be no. some form of farming and industry. But um, but I guess the point is it, it has an enormous impact. And we're there debating it in Parliament. And the only thing I could get out of the, opposition, out of the government, and I should say the opposition as well, is saying, look at the science, look at the science. They wouldn't talk about what no. that science was. They just used the word science. Yes. Which means they believe that everything under that is legitimate That's and right, quality assured. Yep. And we are, So we're making decisions just based on the science. Well, who is the science? Because no one owns science. No. Um, it's something that needs to be so highly... goes through so much rigour before but, it gets to the politicians. That's right. But I think you've, got, you've come to the nub of the problem that, that you have... Most people, you talk about scientists and they say, oh, well, we believe scientists. We think they're very trustworthy, yeah. right? And we, of course we do because we've, we've inculcated that in people in school and we should be able to trust the scientists. And in many areas of science, they, it is totally trustworthy in engineering, in most of, in most of the medical stuff um, you look at, it, it's totally reliable. Mm. But there's an area, and it's sort of the ideological end of the science, uh, especially in, in the environmental sciences, where in fact the scientists are not necessarily being scientists. Mm. But even in the biomedical area, a lot of the peer-reviewed work turns out to be wrong. So I was at a Senate inquiry um, two weeks ago and Senator Carr from Labor really started to take issue with me talking about this replication crisis. And he clearly had no idea about this and that actually scientists are talking about it that scientists are saying we have a problem Houston we really have a problem what's the replication process the replication crisis is this business where 50% of the peer reviewed work turns out to be wrong right right. this is not just a little bit of an you know it's like a a used car salesman you know 50% of their cars they sell don't run that's as bad as it gets isn't it right so we're actually much worse in terms of reliability I I say we as a scientist Mm. right um, than car salesmen or virtually any other profession. Now, most people, when you say, did you know that 50% of peer-reviewed literature is wrong, they think I'm just crazy, right? And yet, it's been talked about every week in the major scientific journals, right? Mm. We don't allow that to get... We don't like it to go into the, the, pub, the public media. Yep. We're talking about it amongst ourselves. Yep. But there is a real problem there, and most politicians have no idea about it. And I, I, I get it, I, you know, because we should be able to trust scientists. It's only when you sort of move out of the city where this science is, dodgy science, is being used um, that people start to realise, well, this just doesn't make sense. Yep. And that's why you've got this split between the country and the city. The city people believe the science and um, with looking at this and saying, well, we believe in proper science, no doubt about it, yep. but what we're seeing here is not proper science. It's yeah. ideology yep. masquerading as science. Yep. Yeah, I, you know, um, if I got off of like from my point of view where, where this stuff plays out, um, you, know, you can cut and paste the same sort of prejudice that you've fallen victim to um, in the state government. They're facing integrity crisis at the moment and a lot of people get caught up in the, you know, yeah, they're, they're corrupt, so get rid of them. And it, to me, that's not the real issue. The re- issue is that there's evidence there of that. There's that gut feel, that intuition that we know there's this influence that permeates right through the public service and through the departments, then through the uh, u- universities, and, and everyone sort of falls, um, gets scared to speak up yep. against the majority. Yep. And that's what annoys me so much about this integrity crisis is it's, it's material 
evidence, like when a laptop's been stolen off an integrity commissioner to wipe files, and that that demonstrates to you that there's people scared of yeah. things getting out there, and, and and that we need to keep controlling the narrative. Why? Yeah. I mean, we're supposed to interpret the narrative of the people in government and say, okay, that's that's where it's leading us. Let's not be scared of it. Embrace it and work with it. Yeah. And um, you can, you know, whether it's youth crime or um, you know, economic it, the degradation of like regional communities, rural communities, and their their issues. Look at them, deal with them. But yeah. um, people are scared to report up the chain to the yeah. government. And so there's sort of like a cultural problem that when people are scared like that, you you get groupthink forming. Uh, group and this thing, is yeah. this is really what's happened in science. So mm. it's exactly the same. People, I mean, the number of scientists who will say to me, you know, I totally support what you're doing, but I'm not in a position to be able to support right. you because oh, it's yeah. more than my yeah. job's worth. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you got to say, well, all right, they've got a mortgage, they've got kids. Sure. So, so this is why we do need to do something about the whole culture of science and allow, you know, the, the whole peer review process actually almost guarantees groupthink. Um, you know, so the way peer review works is that I publish, a, I have a, some work, I, it then goes to a journal, the journal sends it to some peers, other scientists, they look at it and they say, oh yeah, it's right or it's wrong. It's usually a very cursory process. Now they're, they're peers, right, so if they disagree with that result, they may well say, no, we don't believe this work should be published. Yep. So what happens is that the individual who's got a new idea can, in many cases end up being excluded. So, for example, the um, the guy, the Nobel laureate, the Australian Nobel laureate, who discovered that stomach ulcers were caused by bacteria, he was ridiculed for ages because up till then they said, no, there's no ba- right. there's no bacteria in, in the stomach. This guy's a complete nana, okay? Yeah. Turned out to be right and he got a Nobel Prize, but not after going through a whole bunch of problems yeah. because the peer review system inculcated groupthink and fear. Yeah. So do not support this guy because you won't get a research grant you won't be able to get your public uh, papers published yep. so it is really important that, that a free argument is allowed to happen it's in all aspects you've, yep. you've mentioned this integrity thing and i can totally get that there, there'd be similar things happening in in other aspects of life and yep. it's very important well I, I remember jumping onto you early when it came up and i thought wow what like what a breath of fresh air for someone like me because i'd I'd gone through the uh, vegetation management uh, through yeah. a couple of, and and that's one I do have a fair bit of insight. Of, so, uh, same problem, by the way. The the science behind vegetation management is not science, right? There's some science there, but the oh well, not. I'm well aware of that. Because <laughs> I've had direct conversations with people in politics yeah. who are involved with the process that yeah. said, oh, we 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 needed a political outcome. It wasn't in a response to any scientific data or yes. any evidence. And you, throughout that debate, even. Um, and to their credit, you had natural resource management groups who were the scientists out in the savannah grasslands, the forests and those yeah. grazing areas saying, this doesn't really make okay. sense. And in fact, this could, there's an argument this could deteriorate land conditions. Yes, definitely. And uh, they were completely at odds with the main authority on land condition out there, which is natural resource management groups. Yeah. But it went through, and then, and then, you know, sort of that was when I became aware of the reef um, yeah. thing. So it seems to be skipping over the same thing. Well, it's the it's the same problem, different environments. So you have the mm. reef, you have vegetation management, you have mm. Murray Darling, and let's not even talk about climate change. That's just yeah. too much, yeah, right? Too but, much. Mm. but those three very Australian problems, mm. you've got ideology masquerading as science. You've got almost certainly bad environmental outcomes occurring because we're not following genuine science. Yeah. Um, but you've got the same problem of scientists unable to say what they really think because they know exactly what will happen. Yeah. I mean, I'll give you an example. With the Murray-Darling, the, at the bottom of the Murray, there's Lake, um, was it, Alexandria, yeah. right? And in the 1920s or 30s, they blocked off the, the entrances to the, to the, from the sea to the lake. The, the Murray goes into this lake. And it went from a saltwater system to a freshwater system. Right. And now a whole bunch of, of the, you know, the irrigation water allowances is based, predicated on trying to maintain what was a saltwater lake as a freshwater system, right? <laughs> and the scientists in CSIRO, the so-called scientists in CSIRO, don't let on, actually, this is a saltwater system here, yeah. and we're pretending it's a freshwater yeah. system. 
So some of the stuff is just completely barking mad, and yeah. it doesn't matter whether it's Murray Darling, Vegetation Management, or Great Barrier Reef. You have the same fundamental misappropriation of the scientific method. Yeah. Um, Sign um, ideology, ideology masquerading as science, and we're getting really bad outcomes yeah. for the the country. It is very difficult too, isn't it? Looking forward, and I don't want to be too negative, but it's um, because you know, well, you say you would meet the same resistance in trying to engage. You know, you've got a lot of youth coming through that um, seem to have short attention span on um, yep. on trying to scratch the surface on these issues. Yep. So, And they're uh, 100% indoctrinated. You use, in word, you use yep. one word like environment or yep. science, mm-hmm. and um, th- beyond that, they, they are, um, they're just re- they're going to find it really difficult in the future to open their minds and try yep. and be objective and, and discerning on these uh, on these judgment calls. And um, yeah, we, Well, they've gone through 12 years of indoctrination been indoctrinated. in schools mm-hmm. and then another three years at university. That's why we've got this Reef Rebels program where we're trying to get to young people mm. and show them, you know, guys, you've, you've actually really been deceived on a lot of what you've been told here. Mm. And we're hoping that that youthful rebellious spirit might make a spark Mm. at some stage there'll be a spark and they'll suddenly realize so much of what we've been told about the end of the world remember many young people are genuinely seriously depressed and i mean clinically depressed about the state of the world Mm. when in fact the world's never been in a better shape right can we go back to the reef then because um there's there's a few standout facts for me just the the skinny on the reef um and one was the coral cover yeah. at the moment. So the coral cover... It if we read the news, I'd say it's it's endangered. There yep. must be 10% of what it used to be there, and it'd be, yep. it's it been decimated. So tell us what uh, your findings are. The last are. survey from the Australian Institute of Marine Science showed that we have never had more coral than we had last year. But that can't be true because it's endangered, and <laughs> UNESCO is here, but tell us it's <laughs> in trouble. Exactly. So, but, but How can are... you reconcile that fact with anything else I've heard in 10 years well, in the media? Well, you can't. The, the two can't be... One of those facts is one of those things is not true. But the the fact is that the coral survey, which has been done every year since 1985, yeah. shows that we are at record high or near record high. Um, if you want to be the worst, absolute worst case scenario, yeah. we're, the worst case is we're nearly at record high. But in fact, I think we are at a record. Um, we're certainly not. A, we haven't lost fifty percent since nineteen ninety or any of those things. Yeah. But you try to get that out. The ABC just will not touch that. Nobody touches this because they just want to hear the doom about it. Mm. But there are other incredible facts. You know, farmers are criticised. All the pesticides are killing the corals out on the Great Barrier Reef. But when you actually take a water sample on the Great Barrier Reef, which is you know fifty to hundred kilometres offshore, the concentrations are so low that they are undetectable. It's not just, you know, they're below some sort of You don't have the instruments strong enough. You cannot, the, even with the most unbelievably sensitive equipment where you can measure down to one part in a billion billion, you know, you cannot detect them. So what do this, the so-called management scientist people do? They say, oh, well, we can measure it in the rivers and therefore it must get out there. Well, all right, you can measure it in very low concentrations. Well, just clear that up for me because as I understand it, a river system that flows into the reef yeah. is reef is defined as reef waters. They're reef waters. So they'll, they'll often talk about reef waters. That's astonishing. Yeah, that's right. I think of reef waters as clear blue ocean water. Which 50, it is. 50 kilometres offshore. Which, which it is. And, of course, one of the point, things... There's that river I've... that almost goes back to Roma that flows into the reef. Exactly. That's a reef that, water. That's right. But when you look at the volumes of water that are coming down the rivers compared with, you know, the, the Pacific Ocean, the East Australia Current, the North Vanuatu Jet, the, the North Caledonian Jet, these are massive ocean currents which flow into the reef and then out of the reef. Yeah. And they, they make the water this, you know, spectacularly iridescent blue colour. Mm. There's more water that flows into the reef from those big ocean currents in just eight hours than comes down all the rivers in a whole year. So the, bit, the real rivers that really matter to the reef, that really determine the water quality, are the East Australia current and these other currents coming in from Vanuatu and New Caledonia. So, and we're passing laws in the state government that could potentially destroy the cane industry yep. in the long term yep. based on the risk that a particle of fertiliser, yep. silt or fertiliser, can move 50 to 100 kilometres Yep in enough quantity 
to do damage in, in enough, eight hours. And that's the important thing, enough quantity to do damage, right? In, in eight yes, hours. Yes, some of those molecules are getting out there in such incredibly yeah. low concentration. I'm, I'm breathing in some uranium right now. Well, you, well, you are. <laughs> there, there, there's, I can't forget how much it is, but there's something like 20 tonnes of uranium floating around in the water out there. Yeah, at the moment. Yeah. It's in such low quantities because the reef is as big as Germany yeah, that yeah. it doesn't matter. Mm. But it's not like there isn't nitrogen and phosphorus out there already. Yeah. There's a hundred yeah. times more nitrogen and phosphorus cycling naturally in the Great Barrier Reef waters mm. than comes down all the rivers from farmers. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, you're adding just an infinitesimal amount yeah. to what's already there. So, look, there is no doubt yeah. the reef is in absolutely spectacular condition. Sure, a lot of coral sometimes dies, but things have got to die. You know, yeah. that's what happens. Bushfires on land, bleaching events or cyclones is the big killer of coral. It goes through cycles where sometimes it's pretty ordinary, other times it's really good. Turns out that at the moment it's in really good shape. Yeah. Now, maybe this latest ble <coughs> excuse me, bleaching event might have knocked it down a little bit, but this is just part of the natural cycles of the reef. The more recent one that's taken interest, I guess, out on the oceans, and I don't spend much time out in the ocean, I tell you, but I've, I have become aware that the Spanish mackerel it seems to be the new battleground. It, it's almost like a dartboard they throw. What else you got, guys? We need some. We need something to throw in before the election, or we need we need to create a fight between uh, some tension between environmentalists and this group. And not. I, I think there's an there's an ideological component within the Department of Environment and Fisheries and, and that uh, to try to close down more or less the whole fishery along the Great Barrier Reef. Yeah. And essentially, what they've done is they've they've claimed on the basis of really no new information that suddenly the mackerel fishery is in dire straits. Yeah. But the most the worst part. I think they've said seventeen percent. Down to supposedly seven seventeen percent yeah. of what was ha what, what it was in the nineteen hundreds so the early nineteen yeah. hundreds. But um, the the worst part of it is not the fact that it's based on some data which is highly questionable. You know, do we really know how much fish was caught in nineteen twelve? I mean, it's a joke, right? <laughs> let alone 1941 or, you know. Agreed. So, so I won't even argue about that, but the peer reviewer of this report, and peer review is often pretty cursory, but in this case they did a pretty good job, they actually disagree with the conclusion, right? So they, they would claim that the fishery is probably more at 60% rather than the 17%, so actually in really good shape. Um, but the, the government is claiming that the peer review supports the, the uh, report when actually... The peer reviewer <laughs> criticises very badly the report and disagrees with the main thing. Hang on, Peter. Yep. Rewind. Say that again. The peer review has disagreed. The peer reviewer disagrees with the report, I, but the government to... is claiming that the peer reviewer agreed with the that report. That is hard to comprehend. comprehend. So how, the, how do you get that? So it's one thing for the peer reviewer to disagree. That's okay. I don't have a big deal with that. But for the fisheries people and the government now to say the peer reviewer agreed when he says very explicitly that he disagrees. That's just deception. Now, maybe it's deception that wasn't, um, you know, deliberate, but there is deception going on here. Yeah. There's a couple of things I've found out in the, um, just in the, and this stuff's come before me in Parliament, they, they've, the data they collect, so my understanding is fisheries don't go out and, catch fish or tag they just get the data off the commercial fishermen yeah. and the rec recce's as well that's right yeah. they they capture that data and then put it through their synthesize it through their models and yep. spits out the other end and they modify things i yeah. would argue just to get the we keep modifying it to get the result play <laughs> well, around it this. sometimes looks like that yeah. I, I, yeah i remember doing this on financial model in my previous yeah, career exactly. where you, you, Same deal. um and uh and um, they spat out this 17% on mackerel, but the fishermen had said, okay, that's curious. Can you give us back the data that I gave you? They said, oh, no, no, that's that's ours now. You can't have that data. Yeah. And and I think, well, that's curious, isn't it, that you wouldn't get, that's their data they've given you and you can, won't give it back to them. There's no doubt there's some very dodgy stuff going on on fisheries mm. and um, they're lining up to cut down the prawn, the tiger prawn fisheries. On, there's, a, there's a few of them that they're, they're, they're lining up to cut down on. And, you know, I'm sure you, know, you and I would be the first to agree if the fishery's in trouble, then we've got to do something about it. But all that's happened to here is they've changed the, the numbers in their model uh, whereas, you know, nothing's actually actually happened out there indicating that the fish um, uh, catch has declined yeah. or anything, anything significant. 
So you've just got to wonder, is this science or is it just ideology masquerading as yeah. science? And I think it's certainly the latter, especially when their own peer reviewer disagrees with it. Yeah. <laughs> and yet they claim that he agrees with it. And for the you know politicians, this one's an easy one because... There's not many fishermen out no, there. There's, you know, the number of uh, mackerel fishermen. Uh, I, I don't know how many, but you're probably talking hundreds. Yeah. Not, 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 oh, if that, yeah. Yeah, if a, that. Yeah. Right? Uh, so not very many votes, no problems. And, yeah. of course, what will happen? We'll stop um, taking mackerel and we'll now import fish from Thailand. We'll have Mekong Delta catfish on Where the, the environmental impact is mm. hundreds of times worse than our well-regulated fish. Yeah. So what we do is we export the environmental problem, the people in the cities get a nice warm in, in, inner glow, but yeah. we're actually doing more environmental damage from these yeah. things. Not, not to mention, God forbid, the economic thing, which seems to be a dirty word, any, any economic we now, benefit we, we get from it. We now import <laughs> about 70% of our fishery into Australia, right? Despite having the biggest uh, area of um, ocean per capita by far, yep. and I think it's the third biggest ocean area of ocean, you know, full stop. Yep. So we have an enormous amount of ocean, and yet we, we nowadays, we didn't used to, but nowadays we import 70%. Import. We, we've got a, KAP's got a seafood labelling country of origin uh, bill, so um, they label fish in the fish in the grocery stores or at the fish markets, yep. but they don't need to in cafes and restaurants, so we said right. we want to extend it. Yep as the Northern Territory does to, to so just so it puts the I like it does with gluten free yeah. or V yeah. but the pushback from the restaurant caterers has been well you know but you can't supply that um, you can't supply that uh, we used to be a net um, a net uh, exporter yeah. of f seafood that's right and not so long ago and but he's right we can't supply it because but that's because you keep you keep because killing we, the industries that's everywhere. Right. There's been just a, a <laughs> ramping up of regulations to a crazy degree, and yes, we slowly on our way to totally killing the Australian yeah, fishing industry. Yeah, dear it, it, it's not going to happen. They're not going to say, "Oh, we're going to close it." Yeah, but they just up the regulations so much that one by one, yeah, people but fall out of the market. Again, Peter, I think you know, a politician that that is smacked dot on the face uh, of the, the premier and the yeah. ag minister mm. to to call that out, and I mean. We're the ones that are supposed to see the pieces in the puzzle there and say, um, you know, if d that's how it's got to play out. Yeah. I, um, we had um, Department of Agriculture and Forestry talking about, um, I'm really going wide here, but talking about bees and harvesting and mm. and the um, how it enhances productivity on the, on the yeah. horticulture industry. It's massive. I, d I didn't realise how big a role okay. bees play in the productivity of horticulture. So mm. you oranges, your citrus, mat, your nuts, your macadamias, all the... So many, just about everything we grow re relies yeah. on the on the pollination as yeah. a as an enhancement of productivity, and there's a bit of tension there about national parks and state forest conversion and removing opportunities yeah. for them. But the the whole point for me was that DAF came to address the parliament and just really presented themselves as an administrator of we process leases and. I'm sure when the Department of Environment comes, they will give us all the thousand reasons why it's terrible and everything that's going wrong. Yep. So they're an advocate for the environment, but DAF isn't an advocate, our department isn't an advocate for agriculture. And then you say, well, who sits back and looks at this stuff and says, oh, we've got a problem. This could impact production of horticulture, our seafood, we've got a problem yep. there. How's the environment? Someone's got to be a leader. And, the, and that's where I think you've, you've got a massive absence of that leadership in politics to s sit back and say well this problem relates to that and i i, I understand your environmental imperatives yep. but there's an impact here so yes. we need to balance that up but yeah. it's just environment and there's no weight and at nothing all in, else. No, that's right uh, yeah. and but you're seeing that in almost all institutions i mean even the csiro i mean we used to have csiro out at lansdowne doing yeah. a lot of work now it does very little work on productivity right a whole lot of the work that's done by csiro up north here now is great yeah. barrier reef related supposedly because farmers are killing the reef yeah so right across the board um nobody's going into bat for agriculture mm. at all uh, and it's a great problem so i won't disagree with you much on mm. that right mm. You, you try and get those messages out there to, um, the, and hope people educate themselves and make their own, but start thinking for themselves on this rather than just yeah. rabbiting off the science. And um, it sort of brings to mind the fact that, um, um, well, 
if I draw on my own experiences and and why I just um, why it's just so cathartic to hear someone like you speak, it, it's it's like um, playing a playing one of your favourite songs on the on the you know, iPod and, and your um, and on your phone now because it's it's just so lovely to hear when something rings true with your intuitions mm-hmm. and I think that is the hope that we've got out there and that there's I think there's people like me that can't ground truth and you, you talk about depression and mm-hmm. and um and, there, and there's you know mental illness is a huge problem out there and mm-hmm. I think it's so much deeper than what um the, than just giving more support and you know they no. talk about treating the symptoms like well, there's these deeply can I, embedded issues. Can I interrupt issues. you there because I'm worried I might forget but you know, I've spoken to a lot of cane farmers, a few cane farmers who said, you know, my son or daughter came home and said, Dad, we're killing the reef. You're killing the reef right. with all the fertiliser and pesticides. Wow. Mm. And, you know, they said, can you imagine how much that hurts? Mm. You know, we're not just killing a, a, some tree somewhere or some bit of scrub. We're yeah. killing the Great Barrier Reef, one of the, the wonders of the world. Yep. And you've got your, you know, 13-year-old accusing you of doing that. Yeah. How do you reckon that hurts? Yes. People have no yep. idea how much that hurts those farmers. So the farmers are not just affected um, financially, though they're going to be. And yep. a lot of them are going to be pushed off and agribusiness is going to take them over and the big business is going to go in, right? But the the they hurt personally because they're being accused of something which is utterly despicable if yep. it's true and of course it's not true and we shouldn't be doing well, this but i think there's even something deeper than that in that i'm not a farmer and you know i don't have that conversation but it hurts me that we're deviating from truth and science and yep. and evidence and facts so um so easily uh, so fluidly the government can just dance around facts and and deliver it that you think well h- how do we work off well, how does society just, work then if um, well, if they're, they're allowed to so fluidly move in and out of truth and evidence? It, it don't. It doesn't. It will be a disaster if we continue on. But I still have faith that, you know, eventually the truth wins. Yeah. And that, you know, that, 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 that I will win on the quality assurance thing. I may well be proven to be wrong on aspects of the, the science, right? I'm yeah. happy about that. But on the whether there's enough quality assurance in the science, we are going to win this, Ooh. right? And we must win it. So I say to people like Senator Carr, who was so critical in mm. the Senate inquiry, that for goodness sake, read this literature on this replication problem in science, mm. that there is a quality assurance problem and that it doesn't matter which party you're in. It really doesn't matter. This goes across everywhere. We all need science to get to the truth. We need to base our decisions on good science. Yes, politics and all sorts of other things come on on the end, and that's where it matters, whether you're Labour or Liberal or CADA. Mm. But all of us depend on that good, solid information to base it on, and we're not getting it at the moment. Now, that's just the truth. We're not getting it at the moment. And I... The, you know, I know this battle that I'm fighting. I've been going for you know three or four years since being chucked out of the university, and there's going to be another decade before we win. But we will win this because mm. it is the truth, and there's enough scientists who know about our quality assurance problem, yep. and it is going to come out. Yep, I understand, and uh, I, I feel I'm in a similar spot because it's the KAP. Um, our party's probably it's not the. It's not the path you'd take if you wanted a roaring political successful career. <laughs> yeah, it's not the easy road. But you're doing but, it because you want to do the right thing in the same way and, as I'm doing it, because you, I just want to do the right and thing. And I have to have faith that that the things I stand for, which may not be true for a lot of people or may, you know, but I've got have that if uh, that they'll resonate with enough people if you say them long enough. Um I see actually some of the things economically, like I probably I probably got interest interested in politics more on the base of economic rationalism because everyone was just obsessed with the free market and it's interesting to see now some of the politicians even using the word economic rationalism which I think I, I used to think everyone was just unconscious um, in an unconscious state when it sort of came to thinking mm. beyond basic policies but um, they're saying now we think we got it wrong with the economic rationalism we're starting to question it now which is refreshing and, and goes to what you're saying mm. there is it is possible to break through what seems an impossible situation. Yeah, that's right. I mean, things can change. I mean, you've even seen with this thing in the Ukraine, you look at the way the Europeans are reacting to energy now. Mm. Just suddenly it was like a, flip, uh, a switch was flicked. 
And but there was a whole lot of base work, a whole lot of groundwork had been laid by a lot of people arguing mm. about energy independence and all the rest of it. So that when the time came, it was easy for the, the switch to be flicked. Mm. And that's essentially what what I'm trying to do um, with help from anybody who, will, you know, and I don't care which party they, they're uh, associated with. Um, we're laying the groundwork showing there is a problem with science. Uh, the way we carry it out, we've got to solve it, um, and we will eventually get there. Yeah, it is, I mean, to, I'm I'm often much less critical of individual politicians um, in my game because I think it's a party system that the rigid two party mm, system yeah. that has curtailed. Because I sort of share I'm, I'm nowhere in your sense of um, your level of martyrdom, but um, I'd still. I share a similar experience where a lot of MPs will often say, I mean, mate, I totally back you on this. I yeah. agree with you, but I can't, I, yes. which is saying to me, I need to keep my job yes, <laughs> that's right. as an MP. And it's, it's in, my income's important to me being a part of this system. Yeah. I do agree with you though, and I'd love to support you. And I, that yeah. idea is good. Yeah. So I do get a sense of that. But, <laughs> I, but I also have more time for politicians in general of any description, Labor, you know, cap, you name it than I have for the bureaucracy and oh, yeah, the scientific word. institutions yes, yes. who are deceiving those politicians. Yes. So you have some politicians, no, good some point minister, well made. you know, Labor minister in this case of the environment, yeah. flat out doing too many things, yes. you know, just overwhelmed by, t- by such a lot of work. And they're trying to rely on yeah. this information yes. which they're being given, yeah. and it's wrong yeah. information. So I'm very, very forgiving of a minister making the wrong decision based on wrong information. Yeah. The problem goes back down to these scientific institutions. Yeah. So going, going back to that debate, it's still live in Parliament at the moment, actually. Um, but I would have mentioned 10 or 20 times yelling out, saying, record coral cover, pl- just answer. Yeah. yeah. And the best answer they came back was, look at the science, and, or Peter is just one person. Yeah. And, uh, and that's all. That's good. Thanks very much for that. But I'm still but asking it, you, please getting, answer the question. But it's getting through, right? They, <laughs> they, people are getting, you know, slowly but surely, we're getting that uh, statistic across. And yes, they don't, want to, they don't want to know that statistic. But they could blow us away. They could blow KP, the reef bill away if they just answered the question. Yes. And, and yep. I'm sure that... Maybe there's some data they could pull up to, but they've got 220 staff in Parliament. We've got one and a half. Yes. Yep. So I'm sure they've got enough people to dig something up from the the, the billions of dollars that's been uh, spent over the years into the reef. Sure, they've got something yeah. to counter that statement. Record coral cover. They didn't. No. Well, so it's true. It's because it's true. And this is the power of the truth, right? This is the power of the truth. And you just got to have faith. Mm. Mm. I, I, you know, again, draw my own personal experience. Uh, I have a, I get a burning feeling if things don't ground truth, and it's an uncomfortable. You can't live with it. Which, yeah. um, and then someone says something, you go, ah, I feel better. That, <laughs> and you know, they say the truth sets you free. Yes, like, oh, it does. Well, thank goodness. It does. Because now yeah. the world makes mm. sense again. Yep. Because I can reconcile what I'm seeing with. Yep what's happened I can see how it's happened great now I know it and that's the experience I had when you I started had the first conversation with you about reef I said that that makes perfect sense I can see how this works I can see how the politics has played into this and yep. the cultural shift that yep. of environmentalists yep. and I, this all makes perfect sense for me and that doesn't mean I'm absolutely right but it just makes no. me feel good and I, I have faith that people out there have that same sense inside them but it needs they need that exposure to unlock that so yeah. that they can um, they can then find that sense of um, but, but we're, I think I'd, I'd like to think we're at the bottom of the trough because everyone is so tight and wound up into this we must speak in this no we've, we're not at the bottom we're coming back out I, I am completely sure that the situation that I was in three or four years ago was much we, we've actually been able to swing quite a lot of politicians in, in Various right. part. People are seeing what's going on. I mean, the the number of people that I'm now in contact with social media is just huge. Right. You know, so we, yeah, we've got a, a heck of a long way to go. Yeah. But we have turned the corner. I don't have any doubt about that. On mm. a lot of these environmental th- things, people are seeing there is a degree of exaggeration. There's a d- degree of opportunism. There's a distrust for a lot of the so-called authorities. So we are we're heading in the right direction, I think. Yeah. Mm. So um, yeah, I, I, you know, it's 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 late in the in the conversation. To, um, 
introduce it, but I don't really want to spend any time on it. But I, I think it's a really important comparison to make. But with the whole role of the public health directives in the COVID, um, uh, their government's approach to COVID, one of my lead arguments in the debate was saying to the government, you are reaping what you sow. <laughs> yep. You're now telling us, trust us on the science. Yes. Well, how can I? I, yes. I, I mean, you, you could be right. Yes. But how can I trust you? Because you lied to me about tree clearing. You lied to me about the yes. reef. I know you're lying on these issues. Yes. yes. So how am I supposed to believe? And it makes me so angry because I'd love to work with, I'd want to be a part of government and, and help, at, you know, yep. especially in a public health crisis. Yep. You want to be able to help, but yep. I don't trust the bloody word they say. And and like you say, it's not necessarily even just an issue with the government. It's that it's that interaction, that nexus of the government and the public service and everything under it. It's that culture that's developed. You're dead right. So I feel the same with the COVID. I don't know enough about it, so I won't, won't comment on what's right or wrong. But I, whenever people say, just trust this scientific authority, I'm saying, well... You know, I can't do that. I, I just I would have done that 15 years ago, but I see so much corruption going on here in the scientific systems and the yeah. lack of quality assurance that I now don't know what to believe. So, yeah. all right, I just get myself triple vaccinated. I'm just going to do that. I'm not going to think about that because I'm trying to think about too many other things. things but do yeah. I do I trust what's going on? No, I can't. And I want. And so my mission for the rest of my life is to try to get that trust back into science by bringing the quality assurance back into it so people can, like you and I, can say, look, we know that there's a good system there. It may be wrong in some aspects of it, but at least there's no corruption in it and we're more likely to get to the right decision based on that. Yep. That, um, I, you know, I, I think that ties into what you were saying earlier in that we have turned the corner and, and that it, it has been really surprising, really interesting for myself to observe some of the the um, pushback on the vaccine mandates from people who, who people who have got vaccinated, yep. who, but I think we're tapping into something much deeper yep. sentiment. I think it's got nothing to do with COVID nineteen. Yes, nothing to do with vaccines. No. It's that burning sense inside that I'm. Just, I just don't trust you guys. Something's I, not quite no, right. Something's here. not right yeah. here. Yeah. And I don't even know how to express it, but I'm just because no. you're getting hundred thousand people turning up to rallies and whatnot. Yeah. And uh, and you think something big's going on here, and yeah. I suspect it's linked to this um, this subversive nature of. Um, and I don't even know what it's called because we can't just blame the politicians. Um, but it's an aggregation of scientific community. No, and that's right. Well, I, I actually don't blame the politicians. I, I um, well, don't I, be too easy on them, Peter. No, 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 There's no. A role for well, them. No, <laughs> but yeah, you're quite right there. But the fundamental problem is in the institutions. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but you know, to pick on the politicians, there's, you know, it wouldn't hurt them in this debate now to just yeah. to say, well. What what have even offer something in return? Not just yeah. say pick on Peter Reid or just say the science. Just put something on the table yeah. that we can debate. Yeah. And um, whether they're, I think it's they're lazy, but I I don't think I don't think there is anything there for them to legitimately produce. So yeah. um, no, I don't think there is. That's where I do criticise. That's where politicians have a role to. I mean, for goodness sake, just stand up on something and. Um, but it, it's unpopular, and then they've got to go against all the university kids that have been indoctrinated who are going to be voters shortly. So That's um, right. uh, it's, it's a big job. I, You know, I, I've got a, a, a card. Um, it's probably called a meme now, but it's a card above my desk in Parliament. It's got a picture of Mark Twain where it says, uh, wherever I find myself on the side of the majority it's time to stop and reflect <laughs> he didn't say it stopped it's changed my mind no, it's right. time Just to stop and it. reflect yeah. mm. and i love that because yeah. um we all think we're right and um i've modified my views on a lot of things yeah, over the too. years mm. because i've been forced to and um and i think that's in our human dna mm. and i think um but that leads me to just um, I, I don't want to um, pump up your tyres too much, Peter. Here in front of you, but um, but I, I was they were ridiculing you in Parliament, and I said, well, to me, the man's a hero because well, thank you <laughs> because um, <laughs> you've stood up. There's not many people willing to stand up and um, throw their careers away and mm. um, and turn their back on everything. And um, and you know we're they're all sitting down there on a parliamentary income, safe seat, and mm. and. Um, well, you know, safe income for the next three years at least, to, to and to ridicule someone that even if you don't agree with them, 
admire the fact that they stand for something. Please at least acknowledge that. And and we need to celebrate uh, the fact that uh, you stood up like that. So I'm very appreciative of you like that, mate, and the stand that you've done. Thanks very much. Thanks, Robbie. I appreciate it. And um, I'm sure we'll be talking again soon. Yeah, great. <laughs> Thanks very much. Bye. Thanks, mate.